Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone, live in Silicon Valley. We are here at Hadoop Summit 2015. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined my co-host, Wikibon's new big data analyst, George Gilbert, and our next guest, Sean Connolly, VP of Strategy at Hortonworks. Great to see you again. Every, like, like every year we have you on to lay out the chessboard for us. There you go. In the Hadoop ecosystem, and now we have a lot of customer data to discuss. Welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, the, the uh, game continues to evolve, and congratulations, George. Great to see you on the team. Great thanks, team. Sean. It's good awesome, to be here. great. And thanks for uh, coming on. Um, ODP, first question, out of the gate, ODP. Boom. ODP. <laughs> What is it? What's going on? Yeah, so I, I, I categorize it in two halves. I'll, I will, I'll talk about the value and why it's important. And then there's this, sort of the other half of, well, I sort of it, make it akin to like, there's the Housewives of Atlanta, Housewives of New Jersey, Housewives of New York. And the sort of, it came out of the gate as sort of the Housewives of Hadoop uh, type of reality TV show, which is the uninteresting part from my perspective. The most interesting thing is- The bickering, is, you mean? Just the, 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 yeah, the side show exactly. of the bickering. He said, she said, and um, it loses sight of what we're really trying to accomplish in the Hadoop market, which is how do you enable the broad ISV ecosystem to build solutions easily on a common platform, right? And th all, all the different permutations of versions and stuff make it very complicated for uh, software vendors as well as solution providers to get their technology procured yeah. by the enterprise, right? So if, if you're built on a, a version that's incompatible with what I've standardized on, then you're held up in procurement. And so it slows the market down. So simply it's a ISV enablement and an enterprise procurement and um, enabling more solutions to flourish and be acquired more quickly. Really simple. Yeah, so, so let's talk about the, um, the value proposition of the market right now. So big discussion on Twitter and certainly here in the cube around crossing the chasm. Yep. Because you know, he even tried to bring it with Merv, but he wanted to bring back the trough of disillusionment, but which is his framework. But you had Jeffrey Moore, multiple keynotes here. We've been on the cube, so we, we'll stay with Jeffrey Moore for a minute. Sure. So crossing the chasm, we've crossed the chasm. That was on the keynote. Is that the industry crossing the chasm? I mean, I can honestly say, George and I debated this. I feel we've crossed the chasm from an industry perspective because it's it's robust here. You look behind us. Yep. People are buzzing. More leads. Bigger names more operational use cases, just it's growing. And so I think we crossed the chasm. But to the customer, are they viewing the chasm crossing as a watershed event? Or are they just saying, hey, still a lot more work to do, or at least letting us hang on to the edge of the chasm? You know, as we yeah, I, I think the chasm provides us a uh, where's Waldo type of metric. Um, the customers, you know, they'll stratify across the technology adoption curve, right? Early majority, which is where we are, late majority, laggard, right? Or sort of last three phases of uh, the market once you're on the other side of the chasm. It's very palpable. Um, internally, when we were set, we set our strategy, um, I plotted where we were and I plotted Merv's numbers into that. And I was like, I do not disagree with, you know, the, the numbers and how they chart out on where we are. 26% um, adopted so far, with another 11% coming in the next year. That's almost a 40% growth on top of that in one year. Um, but from a market adoption, I would say it's it's barbell, um, very large, and um, sort of the small, the medium, and the the uh, you know in between of the barbell is starting to fill up, and that's where the meat of the market adoption happens. Yeah, I would agree, and I think I think Merv's right, and he says the glass is half empty or half full. His survey says that. About half of all enterprises are considering, with respect to Hadoop, Hadoop purchases, or something to that effect. I mean, it's a little bit deeper. Go to the Gardner chair of the report. But that's successful. I mean, that's those are good. You know, I say it could be larger, personally. Yeah. But that's that's a big number. Yeah, I did some uh, looking into. I in in the posts I had an enterprise Hadoop adoption uh, half empty or half full. Um, I basically posited um, it, it's a more legitimate. Uh, comparison, if you look at where the relational database market was about five years into its journey. Mm. So I did some quick looking, right? So uh, 
you know, let's say it was late 70s when it actually got started, round up a little bit, right? So 85 or 86. I encourage you to go look at the revenue numbers of Oracle at that time. Um, interesting data point, Oracle, March uh, uh, 86, one IPO, right? They had 23, 24 million in revenue, um, and then 50 Yearly or million annual, or quarterly? annual revenue, um, and then 50 million-ish uh, the year that they went public. You convert that into 2015 dollars, it's a 2.2 factor. They were 50 to 100 plus million in 2015 dollars. Um, that's where this market is as well, and it's growing aggressively, right? So, so the stats are not unusual, right? We've seen the story. So it's a trajectory that has pattern exactly. matching to other software models. And if you look at the adoption curve, that's the inflection point in 99 customers and 105 customers in our last two quarters, which are uh, over 40% of our total customer base. It's the inflection points arrived. The Oracle, uh, you have a, I mean, a, a great memory to go back, you know, all the way back to '85, mm -hmm. and I think their their sort of initial use case was it was reporting because you know back then no one trusted the OLT, you know, R RDBMS for OLTP. But if you had to pin down one application for for um, um, Hadoop crossing the chasm. What, what would you pick it? Well, that, that was one of the questions I asked. It was you know, sort of a panel yesterday, right? So if uh, ERP and OLTP was, yeah. was the uh, killer app, if you will, for the relational database, yeah. uh, where, where is it or what, what is that for Hadoop? Because we're seeing like supply chain optimization, we're seeing a variety of use cases, yeah. right? Um, you know, is, does the internet of things, um, if you listen to GE's you know, portion of the keynote yesterday, uh, Vince Campisi from GE Software talking about industrial internet. Is there a uh, killer app that emerges out of that? Um, uh, I would I would argue the um, machine and sensor and the Internet of Things use cases are uh, represent about 30% of the interest in the, in our platform. Um, so that's coming on really strong. So I think there's something in there. Um, it has not materialized yet. I would say, and a good bit of it is. Um, it's a multifaceted platform for many okay. different use cases, right? Whereas I think the relational database was tuned to do certain things very well and not be so multifaceted in its in its approach. Whereas Hadoop is very much multifaceted. Okay. Well, you could argue that the acceleration of value in this market with cloud might not hard to do yeah. a, a straight up comparison. But I I see your point. Yeah. But I do agree we're in an inflection point, right? I mean, I would I would agree with the analysis as a way to understand rationalize. The trajectory. Yeah, it just feels very palpable. Yeah. yeah, and the question now is that in the inflection point where it kicks up, where is that? Where are you on that curve? How far down are you? Is it base inflection point? If that's the case, is the, is the, is the angle of the curve straight up? Is it going right. to kick up again? Yeah. So I think these are the things that we'll be watching. Certainly, George will be tracking that. So I want to get your take on that point. With cloud powering hard right now, you're seeing a lot of cloud action yes. in the enterprise. I mean, yep. certainly public cloud. We know that's out there. Google, Azure, um, and uh, Amazon. But now VMware, EMC, others, real heavy duty cloud push, which will reshape the enterprise's data center. Converge storage, flash. Well that's been playing out for a while. It's clearly. been playing out, so that's yep. baking, that's baking out, that's coming hard. Yep. What's that going to do for the growth here? What's your take on that? Because we're speculating that that could have a real change of it, make the inflection point kick up a little higher. Yep. yep. What's your thoughts on that? Have you looked at that and the analysis on well, that? Well, it was, it was funny, I did a, uh, a joint webinar with uh, Lance Olson for Microsoft, right? And it was, you know, um, from a cloud point of point of view, is it up there? Is it down here? What it, what is it? Um, and um, you know, I'm on record on saying yes, it's both. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because the gravity of data is going to dictate where the workload um, and so wor workload is going to be. And then the Internet of Things, if it's born in the cloud, then you're going to want to land it and analyze it in the, you know, out on the network where it's born. Um, in many cases, there's a lot of data inside the enterprise, and so you need to have a strategy that gives you a architecture that can span those. And, and that was one of the things in Arun's keynote yesterday where he demonstrated easy click of Hadoop clusters with, for Spark machine learning yeah. in the cloud, um, so you could democratize the data in the cloud so people can do that in a very agile way. Yeah, I right? think that's the key. You mentioned the couple things I want to unpack and go drill down. The diversity of use cases of it can't really say that's the use case that's going to blow everything up and make yeah. great. 
because there's so many different value propositions across the board, it's hard to yep. put your finger on one, the bowling alley comment. Yep. But what you said, the pattern that I'm seeing with cloud is, whether it's an economics issue or a workload, compute or resource issue, that'll sort itself out in my opinion. Yep. But the issue of standing stuff up fast, that is the common thread. We had Teradata on earlier saying, yep. hey, with Presto, why go buy a Teradata license, go through all that work to do an experiment? Exactly. So I think that thread of standing it up is the true cloud push. Yep. With and no risk, well, mitigated risk. There's an other side to that, which is, once it's you've, you've stood it up, how hard is it to operate? Right. And you know, does the cloud help with that? Or, you know, the, the continuing work with Zambari and Zeppelin, you know, to put a, to put a, it's not a veneer, it's a, it's a suite. You yeah, know, it's a user around. experience for yes. a specific end user. For the admin, yep. for the developer. Yep. How, I mean, to what extent does that play now that you've you know, enable it to work with the cloud and get it up and running fast. Well, and, and the thing is, is there's multiple levels of choice in the cloud, right? So uh, Microsoft has the Azure HD Insight service, right? Yeah. So from an operational perspective, they handle all that for you. You right. just swipe your credit card, spin up a Hadoop cluster, spin it down. Um, for those who want to have more control over what goes in the cluster and turn more knobs and dials, then they can certainly uh, use you know, the technology we showed in the demo where you can deploy on the cloud as an infrastructure as a service. And the cloud is broad in that case, right? It could be OpenStack, yeah. VMware, public cloud, it doesn't matter in that case. Um, but you should be able to appeal to the range of need and the, uh, you know, the range of audiences, right? So if you're a small to mid-sized business, you're not very technically savvy, then you're just, you're, you're going to go to a Azure HD Insight and build your you know, build your solutions and get started very quickly. I got to ask you a question from a tweet that uh, was sent, sent yesterday. So you were quoted as saying, um, gravity can determine where data is stored and or processed in a multi-data platform environment. Yep. I think that was your quote, right? Yep. Okay, so what does that mean? Be specific, kind of drill down. Gravity in terms of the app load, workload? No, gravity in terms of infrastructure? So uh, I've been in the application platform business, right? So JBoss and those, mm -hmm. right? And um, I switched to, so Hadoop, we call it the data operating system, right? Yeah, I love and that, by the way. It's a data-centric platform for your apps to run co-located with the data. So the gravity means uh, if you have an app and it needs to pull a lot of data for the application logic, then you're stuck drinking it through a straw, right? That's not interesting, right? You need to solve that data problem. It's not performance either. Right, so what you need to do is you need to get the apps as close to the data as possible. If the majority of that data is born in the cloud, then you want to bring the apps to that data. If it's on-prem, then you want to bring the apps onto the data. My point is, yes, the apps are both, so you need to bring the platform out to those areas so you can actually operate on the data where it resides. That's awesome. I got to ask you, I ask you a follow up on that because I asked um, the CTO, Scott, the new CTO, congratulations by the way, yeah. great guy. Um, Cube alumni with Teradata Labs in the past, um, super smart. Explain the difference between tools and platforms in this environment because what you basically described is an agile platform. Basically, it moves around its intelligence, systems of intelligence that George is promoting in his research. Exactly. If you have, with virtualization, all this kind of technology, the ability to move stuff around rapidly, you can be efficient. So that changes the game of our old and, school. And containerization is changing it even Orchestration, further. Orchestration, exactly. this is DevOps, it's all beautiful yep. stuff, we go geek out on it. But I got to ask you the question, you know, we talk about this, the VC community, and our startups, and also big enterprises. Oh, a tool is easier, I like a hammer, I can bang some nails in. Oh, platform is very heavy, I got to spend a lot of dough. So those old classic definitions all still relevant today mm -hmm. are now transitioning in meaning. What's your take on, on as the environment changes, what is tools, what are platforms? Is there a distinction between the two? Yeah, so one of the analogies I use is Facebook early on was just a social website. Then they actually explicitly made it into the Facebook platform and that's where it expanded its growth, the ability for people to bring their workloads in the platform. If we relate it to uh, the strategy at Hortonworks, it's a very sim similar model is, and that's why you see us partnering with the likes of Pivotal around Hawk, IBM around Big SQL is, I want their application ecosystems to ride on top of the platform. Why? Because it drives more customer value yeah. and it drives 
uh, you know, drives the industry forward and breaks down the barriers. So you think adoption. it's a smart move by the Cube to have a, the Cube and then have the Cube platform? Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. Franchise, right. which we're doing, by the way. Absolutely. I was quoting these from five. I can quotes from you from right, three, and you 90 need days people ago. to bring their apps to the platform, <laughs> right? <laughs> Content. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, but that is the model: land and expands, very cloud centric. Yep. Get some successes. Yep and then figure it out from there. So tools is not a categorical, I'm stuck as a tool guy or a tool right. vendor. And the thing is, is platforms are inherently, if you do it right, and that's why we feel Yarn is so important, is there will be the next big engine. And we want it to snap in and participate with all that data and bring additional data to the platform okay. as well. So it needs to be future-proof. The platform needs okay. to you know, adapt to what's coming next. When you, when right. you say that, to enable the next engine to to slide in, mm -hmm. are you thinking like Spark as an example of that? Spark's one. Um, you have the data torrent guys who just open source their stuff yes. as uh, as Apex. Yeah. Right. They are built natively on Yarn. Right. They're very familiar with Yarn. They actually uh, did a lot of work to uh, enable Apache Kafka on Yarn. Right. So that's the beauty of open source is you get this technology out there in a very democratized fashion. And if, if you make it easy to slot it in and plug it in, right. then those workloads can come onto the central platform and participate. And they won't be their own silos. Okay. Right? And that's really what it's we're It's classic after. development. You have a branch of open source. People can come in and tap exactly. off that core or core branch, if you will. Yep. Kind of use a GitHub example. Um, okay, so I got to take that concept to the next level. Of open data platform uh, is about consumption. You mentioned about ISVs, about customers. So I talked with a lot of your ODP partners, open data platform partners, and you know all, all of them, we talked to all of them. And the common answer when I ask, is ODP real? From a customer standpoint, not from a Housewives sure. of Hadoop uh, perspective. They all say, look, here's the deal. We love open source, we're going to continue to contribute to open source. It's so fast, there's so much good stuff going on in open source. Our customers don't move that fast. Right. And also our organization has multiple elements and we can't even hurt our own cats fast enough to, co uh, those are my words to get around a core base. Yep. So their value in their mind is to have one set of code that they can support for their customers. Yep. That seems to be the common And it's thread. a common, it's a, is that it, is that right? Would you say it, that's number one? It's it's consuming the common version of, because if you look in the Apache projects, there's a lot of branches, there's a lot of versions, it's very confusing as to which one do you build. Mm -hmm. And then you find each ISV that wants an out of the box experience will build their own permutation. So you have this weird infinite version hell, if you will. Sort and of so if we can all agree on here are, you know, here are the various stops along the way and just mirror those versions into the ODP community from the Apache um, projects themselves, that just simplifies the consumption process. So it's, it's not about changing the nature of how the projects are innovated, because innovation will not stop. We will not slow that down. But we have to have uh, waypoints that people can get on yeah. Uh, on the bus or on the train, so to speak. And then and let that, the customers really just ultimately does. decide. Yep. So I got to ask you uh, an Apache question um, as we kind of wind the segment down. When the history books are written, okay, you said you've been in software business, but we've talked about this past. Yep, and I've, you know, I've been, yeah, you, dealing we all, with Apache uh, for, you know, 10, 15 years. We've all, yep. you know, we've, I mean, our generation, our age, yep. has lived, I would say, first generation open source all the way through, and now it's so awesome, open source is so kick ass. It's, it's just a whole nother ball game. But I want to ask you a question. When the history books write about Apache and its impact, what's it going to say? What, was the, what is, what is going to be the write-up? What was the impact of the Apache yep. Software Foundation for the industry? So I would say it will be rated as one of the top five most influential innovators in the industry, period. History, historically. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Up there with... Apple, the web, yep. everything. And, and just a few years ago, there was an article that, that posted that, where it was Google, Apple, uh, Apache was the number one. There's Linux Foundation, right? There's Eclipse Foundation and other things that were on that list at that time. But I would say hands down from an open source community perspective, the Apache Software Foundation has done more to shape um, enterprise IT consumption of uh, uh, open source technology. What's, what was the key thing in your mind? You had to point to a couple key elements. Because open source kind of, some people look to say, oh, it's a bunch of guys writing code, mm -hmm. you know, drinking Red Bull, going out, drinking beer, whatever they're doing, coding away. Right. What is about Apache? What did they do differently? What was the tweak? What, what, what's this big deal? So, um, a Apache has some pretty strong sort of rules, if you will, and their role is pretty uh, straightforward in that 
they're, you know, they want a thousand flowers to bloom. They're not going to say uh, HBase is better than Accumulo, even though they're both NoSQL databases. They're going to say they are my children, they're both great, right? So they're not going to dictate what versions of these things should work together. Their, their goal is to enable the best communities to flourish. And then they police uh, checking the vendor badge at the door. They don't want vendor shenanigans in the projects, right? It's about community, right? It's about contribution, right? right? And, the, and it for, it's a forcing function for that to happen, right? So um, I'm a vendor in that space, but I have to respect the Apache process, and I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah, and it, it is historic. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Sean Connolly, VP of Strategy at Hortonworks, here inside theCUBE. We'll be right back after the short break. <laughs>